Hello, everyone. Uh, I thought a little bit of backstory uh, behind this video and why it was created was, was probably due. Um, back in 2010, uh, in fact, January of 2010, um, Fred had recently, I believe, uh, come back from a, a heart attack. He had come out of the hospital and he was doing a lot better. Uh, but at that time, um, a number of us, mainly myself and my good friend John Cornu, had a discussion about the fact that, you know, at some point, we didn't know when uh, Fred wouldn't be around anymore. And we thought it would be really important, or we thought it was really important, to get Fred's story uh, about how he saved the uh, largest five-manual Wurlitzer organ ever to come from the Wurlitzer factory uh, and installed it in his house in Racine, Wisconsin, where it still remains. And uh, so at the time, I was uh, working for a school district and borrowed a video camera and John and I hopped in the car and went over to Fred's, and what you're about to see is what resulted from that. Uh, those of you that knew Fred uh, know that he was one of a kind and you know, truly a, a heart of gold, but you never quite knew what was going to come out of his mouth, and so there's a few examples of that in this video, um, and I've simply put those in. Fred was Fred, and uh, this is him. Uh, excuse the camera work. Uh, I obviously, climbing around in an organ chamber trying to handhold a video camera in 2010, they didn't have great image stabilization in those days. So uh, ignore the shaky video. I've left it all in, um, mainly just for Fred's commentary and uh, enjoy the video. We lost Fred back in April of 2018 at the ripe old age of 92. And like I say, the organ is still in the home. Uh, Fred's son is in the process of restoring it, and hopefully it'll be back playable sooner than later, and uh, we'll, we'll get to enjoy the, the mighty Michigan Theater Wurlitzer uh, once again. Uh, I got interested in organs when I was eight years old. Actually, earlier than that, my mother used to take me down to the uh, to the uh, Rialto Theater, Racine, and uh, hear the organist play silent films and stuff like that, that sort of thing. And uh, it was very embarrassing to her because I'd kick her all over the place. And. She didn't like that boat. She didn't have much choice, so we didn't go that too often, but we did go. And after about a month and a half of that way, then I was born. Uh, the sound of the organ, the pipes, would uh, make me kick around inside of her. <laughs> and I decided that's when I was going to buy that organ someday. <laughs> so when I was uh, eight years old, I bought a pump organ from some old lady who lived down the hill from the, where I lived, and <clears throat> I saw this old pump organ sitting on her porch, and I went by it every day on the way to school, and I was intrigued by that. Uh, that wasn't really what got me interested in organs completely. We had a church organist who, uh, in the old churches, you know, early American churches, they had the pipes up in front, and then the organist sat right into the pipes of the tractor organ <clears throat> in the organ case and then below that was the choir and then the pulpit and uh, when you play when she play a hymn with a beat to it uh, her big butt like that would go back and forth on the organ bench in time to the music of course everybody laughed and too well, silently <laughs> that's got me interested in the organ uh, uh, pipe organs <clears throat> so Anyway, I went to this 
lady who owned this pump organ and asked her how much money she wanted for it. She said, well, go home and give me two dollars and then you can have it for that. So I went home and I found two dollars and when I rounded up, boy, I don't know, half a dozen of my friends and we went down there to my coaster wagon, picked the thing up, put it on my coaster wagon, hauled it up the hill. When my mother got home, here was this thing sitting in front of the fireplace, grinning at her. <laughs> and so she liked to sing, and uh, I would play this thing, and uh, she would sing Beautiful Dreamer, <clears throat> and I would play it on the pump organ, and uh, we actually developed a relationship then about that. So anyway, after a while that I went in the service, when I got out of the Army, I was 20 years old, First thing I did was go down and uh, buy the organ from the Rialto Theater, which is in a state of disrepair. The solo chamber had been sold. This was in Racine. In Racine, yeah. And then I went and bought another organ up in Milwaukee from the, I think it was the Juno Theater, uh, which was another two manual where there were five ranks in mint condition and happened to have a three horsepower single phase blower. Fortunately, so I put the two together, and that one became the that became the solo division of the other organ of the first organ, and that wasn't big enough though. So uh, I sold it to a our ballroom out of Lake Geneva, Bigot's Royal Palm Ballroom. That was on Brown's Lake. On Brown's Lake, that's right. Yeah. You're right. I'm sorry. It was not Lake Geneva. It was Brown's Lake. You're right there. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, <clears throat> I saw an ad in the paper in Madison, pardon me, in the theater organ, uh, no, it wasn't theater organ, right? but I had Hazen magazine. Uh, for sale, Wurlitzer organ, $2,000. I still got the original ad. Uh, First Baptist Church, Madison, Wisconsin. So I thought, gee whiz, let's go take a look at that. So my wife and I went in up to Madison, because her folks only lived 25 miles from there. And look, this thing here was a four manual world. Didn't know it was four manual, but I didn't know what it was. It had 11 sets of pipes. It happened to be the smallest world theater organ ever built with four manuals. And uh, they wanted 3,000 bucks for it. Or was it, I'm sorry, 2,000 they wanted for it. And I offered them 500. No, I said, uh, I said, that's too much money. I said, well, uh, they wanted me to offer them $500. Mm -hmm. I said, no, my wife said no. You're not going to give me a nickel more than 300 bucks. So I said, that's it. I said, give me $300 for it. They said, well, if we're interested, we'll call you. Well, that usually is the end of the situation. But I get home and the phone is ringing, come and get it. <laughs> well, they didn't have much choice because they're tearing the church down. Mm -hmm. And so, I went up there with Tom Wrench, uh, who is also in the organ business, and he lives uh, what, a couple blocks from here. He and I went up, took the thing apart over the 4th of July weekend in 1940, 1948, I think it was. And hottest weekend in the world. And the organ was installed up in the upper rafters of the church. Uh, so we had a lot of fun getting that out, something like you would not believe. One of my favorite stories of that is, it was so hot up there, we took all the wind lines off the regulators, off the main wind line coming into the chambers, and turned the blower on to blow the nice cool air up in the basement, <laughs> which worked fine, but gee whiz, uh, every 15 minutes or so, the damn thing would shut off. And I thought, there must be some guy screwing around there pulling the switch on the floor because I'd have to go back and shove it on again. Well, actually, it was the motor wasn't designed for running wide open, so it would automatically shut off on the, uh, the relay that uh, controlled it. So we got it out, all it back here, not here, but back to the scene in the basement of our office, uh, 4,000 square feet of basement. That's a lot of basement to fool around in. Mm -hmm. Set it up and uh, had it there. He even had a radio program on there with WRJN, mm -hmm. which I played and it was, it was 
sponsored by the real estate board and uh, uh, I would play a tune and they would read their listings, I'd play another tune and there'd be some more listings. We had a lot of fun. Uh, when I got rid of that organ, that, the organ went to a, uh, to a recording company. Hmm. That, you knew that, didn't you? No, I didn't know that. Sure, uh, Replica Records. They made records back in the, uh, a lot of organs around the Chicago area back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. They got that and they unloaded the bomb bar to somebody else. And that organ then, of course, uh, when they went broke, he sold it, the guy sold it to a Dr. Lawson up in Montreal, who spent quite a bit of money building a big addition to his house for that instrument. <clears throat> then when he died, then uh, the organ wound up, was sold to a pizza parlor out in San Diego. Dennis Scott played on that organ out there. In, I think it was the San Diego area, I could be wrong. And then from there, it was uh, picked up by the uh, Theater Art Society of San Diego, and the organ was enlarged to about 22 ranks, and is now in the Presbyterian Church uh, in uh, San Diego, where it's owned by the organ club there, mm -hmm. uh, and they put uh, regular concerts on there, uh, and various uh, high-class organists playing, and it's a very successful instrument, and this course uses a church instrument too, and it works out fine. You know, being a guy naturally, always wanting something bigger, you know. <laughs> so, uh, it's part of, part of an egotistical thing that affects everybody, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so I went through, uh, I had a copy of the Wurlitzer installation list that I got from Bill Bunch, <clears throat> an organ builder out on the west coast and he mailed it to me. It was the original copy uh, that the work that the Wurlitzer company had. It was the only copy. And he said, Fred, I'd never loaned it to anybody except you because I knew you'd make sure I got it back. So I he mailed it to me and I made several copies and uh, sold the copies to a couple of guys to cover the cost of the copying. <laughs> and then I went through the list to see what I wanted, because it had every theater organ and church organ that were sort of installed. And I, we just went looking for what I wanted, and make long story short, it sort of had three five manual organs, two of which were installed in the Chicago area and were long gone. One went to a replica, pardon me, went to uh, I Fly Records, who made all the George Wright recordings. And the other went to uh, Byron Carlson uh, up in uh, St. Paul. Yeah, St. Paul. I wrote the insurance to that one when he moved it. Yeah. So anyhow, so this was the only organ left to five males. I figure that's that's really got to be unique then. Not not the biggest, but the, probably the most unique. So I got a hold of the. Uh, it showed it was installed in the Metropolitan Theater in Detroit. Well, that didn't add up, and I realized later through a friend of mine who is now dead, as a lot of them are. Uh, and it was called, he lived in Detroit, it was called the Michigan Theater. So I got hold, I got hold of the city of Detroit, found out who owned the Michigan Theater, <clears throat> and called these people on the phone. Yes, we're not really interested in selling the organ, but if you want to come out and take a look at it, you're welcome to do that. So I went out with my wife and Freddie, who's five years old at the time, <clears throat> went through the organ, it was just what I wanted. So we, we talked a bit, well, we, we don't want it, sell it, you know. So I said, well, I'll tell you something. You guys. I checked with the city of Detroit, the tax assessor's office. And you guys are paying a thousand dollars a year personal property taxes on this organ. And the organ's down in the pit. It was uh, a hole cut in the face of the stage. The console was shoved through and the wall cemented up. The lift was taken apart and tossed out and all the wiring to the board was all disconnected. <clears throat> and it's never going to get used again. Well, then they start thinking about it. And I said, furthermore, once I get the organ out of there, you got more storage space. <clears throat> well, 
we'll think about it. it says, okay, well, we want $5,000. And I says, I'll give you $1,000. That's a year's personal property taxes. Well, they wanted five, but we negotiated at 3000 So that's what I paid for this. And what year was that? 1950, I bought the organ in 1955, and that was the same year Wendy Wurlitzer was born. <laughs> and moved it in February of 1956. <clears throat> uh, I had some problems moving it, I mean, getting out of the theater. The owners of the theater, or the operators of the theater, United Detroit Theaters, he can buy the organ, but he can't take it out. He says, we're not going to be bothered with all that dirt and monkey business. Uh, that's going to go with moving that organ. Because our theater runs from 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning until about the same time at night. So, uh, they said you can't take it out until our lease runs out in about 30 years. <clears throat> and the, the guy called me up and he says, well, we can give you your money back or you can wait 30 years. <clears throat> now, I was just taking you out now then probably, or what yeah. happened 20 years ago. So I said, well, I'm in the real estate business <clears throat> and insurance business. I'd like to come out and take a look at that lease. I'll be our guest, you know. So I drove over to Detroit and he pulls this lease out from the file, shakes the dust off it. Probably about, about as thick as uh, Obama's health care program. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at that and I said, you know, I opened up the back pages or so, a couple of pages back. He said, don't you want to start at the beginning? He says, no. I said, leases are just like insurance policies. The big print in the front gives it to you, and the little print in the back takes it all away. <clears throat> so I says, here you are, right at the very end. It says, everything leased to United Detroit Theaters must be maintained in first class operating condition at all times. I says, when was the last time that work was playing? Oh, I haven't been playing for forever. I said, not only that, the leather's all rotten in it too, and I, you never, it's, I tell him, call a guy on the phone, tell him you're getting bids, and at that time, I told him, I said, the bid's gonna be at least 50,000 bucks to get that organ back in shape. So he calls this guy on the phone, and. His big fat guy, you can hear him yelling on the line. He says, now Hermes is here, he wants to take that. Well, he can take, he can have it, but he can't take it out. Well, he says, he's in the real estate business. We're looking over your lease, and uh, everything in that theater down there has to be maintained. And it says, uh, from, our, from the date of our inspection, you get 60 days to do it. So uh, right now, you've got 60 days to get that fixed up. And he says, uh, or we'll see you in court. And he said, uh, not only that, I says, you're going to have other problems too. So he says, get in the game here. The guy's swearing the phone all the way. Get that damn thing out of here. <laughs> so that was one problem. <laughs> that another problem, there was a, a, a mortgage on this building. And it wasn't much of a mortgage. And they had to get to sell something. You can't sell a furnace out of your house if you got a mortgage on it. Right. You got to get permission from the mortgage company to give you what's called a partial release of a mortgage. So I said to him, uh, I can probably, you write your, your, your uh, mortgage holder and ask for that. They said, yeah, we'll give it to you. So they stalled around for about a month and fooled around. You know how insurance companies are because <laughs> I do business with a lot of them. And, yeah, we're going to get it and this and that. So I finally, I says to the owners of the theater, who's got the mortgage on this? Uh, and they gave me the name of the life insurance company that had it. And I said, that's the company we do business with. So I just called them on the phone and asked them if they still enjoy doing business with us and would like to continue it. They says, yes, why? I said, well, you get that thing over here in the next couple of days and we'll, 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 we'll continue. So a couple of days we had it. Then another problem was uh, Detroit's a union town, and the stagehands union wanted to know what was in it for them, you know. So uh, I said, what do you want? They said, well, just give us a couple of bottles of whiskey and we'll help you take it out, <laughs> which is what they did. I got a lot more work out of them than the bottles of whiskey were ever worth. <laughs> 
So then uh, we, the cables in that organ were, uh, oh my word, long, because the theater was wide. It was about 100 feet wide, and then you had to go from one chamber up and down. And the relay room was in a basement, and my cousin, he was pulling hard on his cable, so he actually walked up the wall with his cable between his feet. And it started coming real easy. I said, you watch that now. If that comes all of a sudden, you're going to have your back on the concrete floor. So as soon as it started to ease up, he said, you came back down and pulled it that way. Mm -hmm. And I had told the moving company, we got a week to take this out. So we left here on a Sunday. We divided the time up between four organ chambers, one chamber a day, and then the console and the relay room on the fifth day, and the fifth and the sixth day, or on the fifth day, and the sixth day was Saturday. Like God created the world, you know, in <laughs> seven days. And uh, I was taking it apart, but out. <clears throat> so I said to the moving company, you got to be there on Sunday. We're going to load this thing on Sunday. No, it was Saturday, I think. Yeah, Saturday. And I said, we're doing it on the weekend because this organ weighs about 30,000 pounds. 30, no, more than that. It was 30 tons. All together. Yeah, they estimated. And uh, all the weigh stations are going to be closed uh, for weighing your trucks so you can get through. And they, we had two big moving van semi trailers. Uh, the van, moving van will hold twice as much as a regular big semi. And I said, be sure to get there in the morning. And I called the police department to post the, the, the street behind so they could park. Uh, no parking, and we get there the next morning, dark, cold, miserable February day. It looks like a storm is coming, which it was, a sleet storm is starting to come. And uh, we get there and here people are already at around 7 o'clock in the morning lining up behind us, lining up the street behind the theater. We went, what's going on? I went to look at the sign that said, no parking parade today. <laughs> so we got rid of them and then we, we took all day to well, half a day to load that. Well, they carried all the big heavy stuff out. Uh, we packed all the pipes in uh, big rug boxes. Big rug boxes about 10, 12 feet long, depending on the side of the rug, and two feet square. And we had, and I had them bring out the several bales of shredded paper, so we just packed the pipes into shredded paper. Mm -hmm. And we got this thing back home, and the one guy, one of my friends, Charlie Conrad, <coughs> He said uh, he used to fly uh, jet planes over in Korea. He said he shot in MiGs down right and left over in North Korea, but he said he thought he did everything, but he never thought he'd take a pipe working down a fire escape and in the middle of a sleet storm in February. So we got it here and the whole damn thing was unloaded in, uh, in one week from the time we went after it in the basement there. And of course we worked on it for two years, re-leathering the chest, doing other things. And uh, when you guys were actually in Detroit, you worked some pretty long days, I imagine. Oh yeah, we started, I don't know, 6, 7 in the morning and worked till 10 o'clock at night, eight, maybe, you know, 9, 10 o'clock at night till we got accomplished what we wanted to do. Right. We were staying over at the YMCA. The YMCA right around the corner, which is a cheap hangout. Right. And then we hit it some cheap, a cheap greasy spoon right around the corner from the theater. <laughs> We got it all back in the, in the, the only thing I carried back in the car, and it was probably a good idea that the rotors started to get slippy, was that I had both washer mannas and boxes in the trunk to hold, hold the car down. There you go, a little ballast. So we got it back, worked on it two years, built this house and this basement for this organ, and it took another two years to install it, and we're still working on it. <laughs> and you always do with these pipe organs. They're never ending projects. You know, they can be in perfect shape to begin with in here, but you're still always going to be working on it somewhere. Here. Well, this basement, or this house, is built in the shape of a T, like in the letter Tom, T for Tom. And in this room here, big as it is, it only, that's only half of what the area is. The wing of the T goes out that way, about 20 feet, and it goes 35 feet, about 30, 35 feet that way, and it goes about 65 feet across here, 
and then the other side of the T is the exact same as here. And within that wing of the T is the what's called the foundation chamber, which carries most of the big heavy fundamental stops in the organ. <coughs> Behind the console on this particular side is the main chamber, which uh, has most of the soft the continental stops. Then over on this side, here, we have the solo chamber, which contains the brass trumpet and the solo stops and all that sort of thing, you know, uh, orchestral oval, solo tibias. Then in the corner over here, where they meet, we have what's called the blower room. We've got a 20 horsepower blower in here. And I also forgot to mention, over in this corner where the two chambers meet in the corner, we've got a two-story room because that basement's about 20 feet deep, which is called the relay room, where all the electrical circuits are made between the organ console and the pipe chambers. And then, of course, is the, the, the uh, I mentioned, I think I mentioned the brass chamber over on that side. It's got the big, powerful two Mirabilis, such as I mentioned before, that bombard in there, and the post horn, which is only two ranks of probably the loudest division in the organ. And uh, then, of course, the, we've got the console in the middle, and the console's on a lift, comes all the way up for. Uh, presentations and we do uh, concerts here and down in the pit for silent films. So that's basically the extents and we can seat about 175 people in here uh, with a couple guys sitting on their laps. I mean, uh, you know, people sitting on their laps, the kids and stuff like that sometimes. Now Fred, this is installed pretty much as it was in the theater except that in the theater the chambers were stacked. That's right. This is The layout is the same. The foundation chamber in the theater on one side was always up on the upper level. The main chamber was right below it. Over on this side, the bombard or the brass chamber was on the upper level. Remember, this theater is about 70 feet high. And below that was the solo chamber. And the reason they put the two louder divisions on the top because they get a chance to blend before they hit the audience in the face. And that was a large theater too. It was, yeah, it had the, 4,200 seats in it. Yeah. Beautiful theater. Sure. Uh, this is what's the foundation chamber. It has uh, the big wood diaphone in here, which is slightly smaller than that big wood bombard we talked about. It has six racks of pipes, or is it seven? One, two, three, four, five, yeah, six, the six, and then the, the French trumpet up there, so it has seven ranks in Which was added. Yeah, added, right. That'd make it to eight ranks, wouldn't it? Uh, what'd you say, six here? There's six, six seven. Seven ranks. Yeah, seven ranks, right. And then the marimba's in here. And the marimba's there, you can get that. And then the 16 foot end of the tibia is in here. Cool. And this and any other word, it's all about flapping lumber. Yeah, all the time she used to say, uh, they work the swell shades, it sounds like a tornado going through a lumber yard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is the relay room where all the circuits are made between the, as I mentioned before, between the organ console and the pipe chambers. Uh, it's double deck room, 8 by 10, oh my God, probably 9 by 12 actually, including the upper area which has all the switches. And you today... Mind I, you mind if I just take out... Yeah, crawl up, there. up here. Make it. It's interesting to note this is all 1920s or earlier technology. That is still going. Yeah, still working. Today, the, today, if I'm buying this organ today, I'd leave, probably leave the relay in the theater, use electronic relay, which would take up the size of a small suitcase. Right. It's amazing to think that what used to take up a 
entire room can now fit in a suitcase. No, and those were all recovered. 50 years ago. Right. Wurlitzer was one of the few companies that had glass front of really That's through. right, you can see something work. You can actually see each pneumatic in there with the contactor bar, which would go down across the contacts, and each one of those is one note. You put the angle like this, you can see the light. You see, you see the contacts there? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm And then up on the wall behind you is the pizzicato relay. Mm hmm Cool. And it all works. Yeah. In the main chamber. How do the saw those swell shots of swell shape? They get you can get a better you view of them from here. And here we have the 16 foot tuba, and then you added the metal diaphragm. Yeah, and also metal uh, cable string behind you there. 16 foot string. And of course, the wooden uh, flute. <laughs> right. How many ranks are in here, Fred? Let me see. Was there five ranks in each chest? That's 10, 11. 12, 13, I think 14. Mm -hmm. Maybe something to note too that all these chambers have that parabolic curve to them. In yeah, the ceiling. Acoustic. Yeah. For that, the acoustics. That makes the sound come out of here. So all the sound is forced out and the swell shades run all the way up to the ceiling. So there's no sound trap up there. Full length and width of the pipework. Starting about at the top of the chest thereabouts and running all the way to the ceiling. And the plaster is about two and a half inches thick on wire lap. Hmm. This is the solar chamber. Or the orchestral chamber, take your choice. And notice the uh, brass trumpet and the brass sax. Those pipes are actual spun brass pipes. Uh, I understand some of them were imported from Germany by Wurlitzer. Well, that's where Wurlitzer started. Was yeah, in Germany. that's right. And there are in here 10, 11, Another nice ranks of pipes in here, I think. Plus you have an extra sax up there, right? Yeah, there's one well, there's extra rank up there. See, that's the, that's the uh, French, French horn up there. Right. Skinner French horn. Now you have a 16 foot string in here too. Yeah, but it's connected. That's a Kimball string out of, pardon me, a Barton string out of a theater down in Chicago was torn down years ago. Ah. I had him actually, I had this thing bolted to the wall, running horizontally. You can see where the hole where the chests were mounted? Mm -hmm. Oh, what a mess that was. <laughs> but I, I haven't got a miter. Well, I wasn't going to spend the money doing that. And this, by the way, is the eight-foot octave of the uh, Skinner French horn. Mm -hmm. This organ has... Everything in this organ is Wurlitzer. Are you recording it? Mm -hmm. Everything in this organ is Wurlitzer, with the exception of the Gottfried French trumpet, the 16-foot pitch, uh, a Kimball wall horn, which is a soft tapered flute, and the Skinner French horn. All the other additions are all Wurlitzer. How many ranks is it now as it is? Uh, I, mean, I think it's about 35. 35, that's about right. Close enough. Yeah, <laughs> ballpark. Close <laughs> enough. Now, this was originally a 15 horsepower blower, wasn't yeah. it? But you had it rewound for 20? Yeah. Okay. What's the static on that? Oh, measure right at the blower, I think it's about uh, 20 inches. Okay. Because the highest pressure in the organ is 15. Right, so we got a good 5 reserve. Yeah. And now we're in the famous brass chamber. Right, the brass chamber. <clears throat> Loudest chamber in the organ. 
home of the Tuba Morales and Post Horn. Yeah, Tuba Morales and Post Horn. The most impressive stops in the organ. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for volume. And what do you have for many toy counters in here? Yeah, the toy counter is up there which has all the percussions in it. Me and my daughter called way up there on a the walk board and walked up there with her kid about a year ago. The ladder up, put a piece on the floor that that's that ain't going to slide anywhere. Yeah, that's a good idea. Well. Well, this is the projection booth. This is called a Brennergraph. This item here came from the Minnesota Theater up in uh, Minneapolis, which was torn down a good 35, 40 years ago. It produces uh, psychedelic light effects on a screen, and they used to do that back in the 20s in all the bigger, a lot of the bigger theaters. It also can be used as a spotlight, it's an arc light. There's a big generator upstairs, another 15 horsepower, three-phase generator, which generates the power for this thing. And it has one unit on top, one on the bottom, and you can fade from one thing into another. There are all kinds of eerie, weird effects with this machine. There are over a thousand slides that you can put in here, plus uh, rotating devices. It has eight, eight lenses on revolving turrets and six mirrors. <clears throat> but that was on, I guess not. Thought I turned that on. Hmm? Must not be plugged in. That's all right. Eh, don't worry about it. And don't worry about that then. <laughs> and this is a slide projector. <clears throat> An arc slide projector, which projects the image of uh, three and a quarter, four and a quarter glass slides that they use in the 1920s of coming attractions like Charlie Chaplin or Ben Hur or whatever they else they had. And also advertising for the different uh, various stores in the area of the theater. And the switchboard itself <clears throat> came from the Uptown Theater in Racine, Wisconsin. The complete switchboard, it operated the lighting equipment for the house lights. Here we use it for lighting everything. The reason it was up in the booth is because the stage, the size of the stage were not big enough to accommodate the full width of a real large switchboard. So part of it was down on the stage, off the stage, and part of it was up here in the booth. <clears throat> so that's where that stuff came from. The various items that you see here are from uh, about 50 theaters in the Midwest which have been since demolished or turned to other purposes. All the ornamental plaster you see, the organ grills, the statuary, uh, along the side walls and the, the uh, Griffiths and everything, Griffins you see, are all from the Venetian Theater in Racine and that was torn down 30 years ago. The orchestra rail, which is probably the prettiest orchestra rail I've ever seen, also came from the Venetian Theater. The chandeliers were part of a large, that is the crystals came off the chandelier from the Piccadilly Theater, uh, where uh, John Cornu uh, has the four manual uh, Kim Kilgan console from. Uh, I had a huge chandelier hanging in the middle of the room and it hung into the projection beam of the movie projector. So I had a winch 
it would pull it up against the ceiling to get it out of the way. One day there it pulled it up too high, and the flash of light and the whole thing went out. So I left it, didn't bother with it for a while because we had all the side lights. And then I took it down to repair it, and the cable that held it up, you know, it was hanging above all those people down there, uh, was burnt about 90% through. <laughs> so we could have had a fan of the opera catastrophe. That's when I took it apart and took wall bracket fixtures like you see those side chandeliers. They were wall bracket fixtures from the Lake Theater in Kenosha. And I took those and took them and put them back to back and then hung them uh, with the crystals from the Piccadilly. That's where those chandeliers came from. As did all the other uh, side light, uh, side lights along here, they all came out of the Piccadilly, except for the hanging lamps on the side, small hanging lamps, they also came from the Venetian Theater. <coughs> the organ lift also, by the way, came out of the Aurora Paramount. They were going to carry, they sold the organ, they were going to tear the theater down, then the last minute they saved the theater, which has turned uh, the Aurora downtown back into a lively area again, which is unfortunate for many towns. Racine, for the instance, didn't have enough brains to keep the Venetian Theater. And uh, the mayor in Racine says to me one day, we're at a party, he says, Freddie said, if I hadn't torn down the Venetian Theater, you wouldn't have had all that stuff in your basement. And I says, gee, I said, I wish I, as much as I love the stuff, I wish it had been kept in the theater. So I could go on and on and on with all the incidental pieces. Uh, this particular thing here, that was above the Procini March. He's a plaster figure and he weighs about, I guess he's solid plaster, probably close to 500 pounds. And the front of the balcony, which you can't really get good from here, uh, all that plaster work all came out of the Venetian Theater. The very center of the balcony actually came out of the theater itself. All the rest were stuff, uh, pieces of plaster made that were laying around in different areas of the theater, and the top and the bottom borders uh, of that egg and dart design uh, came off the regular proscenium arch and I made a rubber mold uh, and uh, cast that plaster so that's all of my making. And we got stars in the sky and we got eye lights. And everything is just like a theater here. The basement bijou. The basement, the basement bijou. Needless to say, the three guys that helped me take this organ are all out, they're all dead now. But they were younger than me. Yeah, but it lives on. Yeah. Oh, I meant, also forgot to mention, all the seats in here came from the Uptown Theater in Racine. They're balcony seats. If you ever <clears throat> have a reason to use theater seats for any purpose, and I've seen it done in bowling alleys and other areas, always be sure to use the balcony seats because I've been in areas where they took the seats off the main floor and when they got them on a flat floor, they were, the legs in the back were too short and they had to shim them up with two by fours because they sloped backwards. 